So there was once a time in my life, as a Christian, where I thought that the whole point of everything was being right about stuff. The whole point. The entirety of Christianity, I kind of saw it as like a test in school. You know, like, that, there, that there's, there's right answers and there's wrong answers, and that all God really wants from us is for us to get the right answers. You know, we fill out, you know, whether it's an essay or it's, you know, multiple choice. I'd always kind of hoped it was multiple choice, but, you know, maybe it's an essay thing, and you, you have to get the right answers. It's like, you know, it's like being in school. If you get an A on the test, well, God loves you. And if you don't, sorry about your luck. That's really what I believed. And listen, I didn't come up with this on my own. I came by this honestly. You know, I grew up in church, and and I kind of always heard this. You know, sometimes it was in a direct way, sometimes in a roundabout way. You know, sometimes you know our preachers growing up always. Every time I had no matter what preacher we had, they always talked a lot about sound doctrine and and making sure we knew the truth. They were very interested that we knew the truth about everything. And you know, I'd go to I'd go to youth group or Sunday school and. That was a little more subtle because what happened was the assumption was just anybody who disagreed with us, well, we should feel sorry for them because they're probably wrong and God probably doesn't love them. So for me, that was kind of my frame of reference is that Christianity is about figuring out the truth. You would discover the truth and then you would declare the truth to everyone. And then when the secular world tried to infringe on our truth, we would defend that truth. And that's what I thought Christianity was for a really, really long time. To me, whether or not God loved me, whether or not God was with me, was pretty well solely dependent on whether or not I was right about stuff. And as it turns out, I no longer believe any of that. Which is a good thing. Because, I mean, do you realize the pressure you put on a person? When you tell them, whether, you know, on purpose or, you know, in a backhanded way, like, hey, there's this God and he's an infinite being and everything about God is, is at the end of the day, unprovable and sort of unknowable. And there's, you know, tons of different religions and tons of different, you know, I mean, there's, there's tens of thousands of denominations, even if you're within the, the, the quote unquote right religion here. And so, you know, do you have any idea the pressure that comes down to, you know, telling somebody, hey, listen, uh, if you get something wrong, God might not love you. Like, there's just so much pressure. I mean, it's, it's no wonder I'm kind of an anxious person. But, like, I mean, it's just, it's kind of a, you know, there's so much pressure. And so there is a freedom of letting that idea go. Of realizing, I think, that Christianity is less about having all the answers. And more about just trusting in Jesus. And it's less about believing that, like, there's this cosmic test. That life is this test. That we have to make sure that we, we get right because we're being graded all the time. And more about just living life in the presence of God, in the presence of the one who made us, who is with us, and who does love us. There's so much freedom in that. And i got to be honest, as a Christian now, I'm, I'm still learning to kind of navigate those waters. But the irony is this. It's not that I just made that up, okay? I did not become, you know, a hippie, uh, liberal nonsense, you know, guy who, who, who's rejected the Bible. As it turns out, actually... The older I got and the more that I looked at the scriptures, the more I found that this idea of God not judging us on our rightness, but instead God working with us, that faith is a process, it's a journey, that's, ex- that's right there in the Bible. You just need to look for it. And I find it in the lives of the apostles. Now, here's the deal. Back in the day when I thought that, like, having everything right was the ultimate goal of Christianity, I held the apostles up to this huge standard, okay? Because, you know, well, the Bible tells us that not anybody is perfect. You know, everybody sins. The apostles are pretty close when you think about it. You know, because the apostles, whether they made mistakes or whether they didn't make mistakes, they were inspired by God, they wrote things, and they, they preached sermons, and they wrote letters, and they would speak by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. In fact, we're told in the Bible that what they wrote was God-breathed. 
which is kind of an interesting thing. So for me, I thought, okay, well, if, if nothing else, the apostles have to be right all the time. And, you know, I didn't always know how it worked. I, I, I always wondered about, you know, how the Bible was written and, and, and how they ended up doing this. Like, I didn't know, like, you know, were they just sitting around and John's sitting in his room and God's, like, whispering in his ear, hey, write this. Or, you know, like, did God say, listen, I'll let you write. And then every time John made a mistake, like, he slapped him on the wrist like a Catholic nun. Like, no. I didn't know if it was that. Maybe it was that. I don't know. Uh, you know. I also wondered, like, what are the limitations of this inspiration thing? You know, like, I w- really, I remember asking this question in college. We, were, we would talk about, you know, hey, so if the apostles tried to write the Bible, is that when it's inspired? Or, like, you know, if, if like, Peter makes a grocery list, is that a God-breathed, Holy Spirit-inspired grocery n- list that's useful for all of my grocery needs? For all eternity. Like, I never knew, okay, what are the limits here? But what I did know is that the apostles were always right. The apostles always knew exactly what it was that God wanted. The apostles never changed their minds, because why would they change their minds? They always had the truth. They had discovered it, and they had declared it, and they were defending it. The apostles always had the truth, is what I thought. But then a funny thing happened. I started actually reading what they said. Take the Apostle Paul, for example. Paul tells us in the book of Galatians that he explains who he is as a person. He says, listen, there's nothing I have said that has not come directly from Jesus. The Apostle Paul basically describes his story in such a way that he had become a Christian, and then he had kind of become a a recluse. He had kind of escaped from the world, so to speak, to get away and, and commune with God. And he said that Jesus himself had shared with him the gospel and told him the truth about things, and that everything that he taught came via inspiration of Jesus. Okay, great. Wonderful. And so as he explained that, as he was saying, hey, this is what I'm telling you, he said, this is what God is telling you. Great, perfect. Well, last week we talked about how there was this issue in the church, okay? And this issue came down to Jewish people and Gentile people. Paul had said he was an apostle to the Gentiles, Gentiles being anybody who's not Jewish. And as we talked about last week, for the first 10 years of the church, everybody was Jewish, it was a Jewish religion. Jesus was a Jewish Messiah. The, you know, the scriptures were Jewish scriptures. So not a lot changed within the church from Judaism to Christianity as far as cultural and social things. Well, one day, some Gentiles get baptized, and they are welcomed into the church. And the Jewish people, the, the Christians who'd been there for the last 10 years, were saying, you know, is that even allowed? And what do we do? I mean, we've been a Jewish religion this whole time. Should we make the Gentiles become Jewish people? Should we ask them to, you know, be circumcised and follow the law of Moses and eat kosher and all that? Or should we just welcome them as, as is? And it's interesting because there wasn't anything in the scriptures about that. Somehow God had not really inspired any of the apostles to know the truth about that because they kind of argued and bickered and tried to figure out what are we going to do. And so they, were the, they had these meetings and they tried to figure it out. There was one meeting in Jerusalem where the, the, the elders of the biggest church in the world at that point was in Jerusalem, and, and the other apostles had kind of traveled in, and they, they, they talked about the cases of the people who believed that the, that the, the Gentiles should convert to Judaism kind of gave their side, and then the other people who said, no, they should just be welcomed in as is, gave their side. And at the end of the day, they kind of came to a compromise. They didn't really make anybody ha- totally happy. They said, okay, well, we're not going to make them convert to Judaism, but we are going to ask that they, they kind of tone down their Gentileness. Because, you know, it's a little offensive to us Jewish folk. And so they wrote a letter, and we're told that the, the apostles wrote it via the Holy Spirit, and then Paul and one of his friends took it to the various Gentiles. And in that letter we read in Acts chapter 15, here's what we read about one specific issue about food. With the Gentiles. We read this. In Acts chapter 15, we read, It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us being the apostles to lay no greater burden on you being the Gentiles than these few requirements. And he said, One, he said, You must abstain from eating food offered to idols. Now, we need to back up a little bit because this is an issue that was going on in the first century world and before, and it's kind of unfamiliar to us. So we have to understand that in the first century world and and before that, everybody is religious. 
Like the idea of not believing in a god or gods or goddesses, the idea of not having some sort of religious faith was just super unheard of. Like there's not atheists walking around. The only argument was not, is there God or is there not God? It was, which gods do we serve? Okay, And so most of the gods, the vast majority of gods and goddesses that were worshipped could be worshipped via an idol. They would build a statue and it would look like the god or goddess that in question and, and they would worship that idol and that's how they did it. Well, one way to worship an idol was to offer it a sacrifice. And you offered a sacrifice of an animal. Well, one day somebody came up with the, 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 the light bulb goes off. They say, okay, we're, we're killing this animal. We sacrifice this lamb or this goat or this sheep or whatever. We sacrifice this animal to the idol, and then it just kind of sits there and rots. Like, uh, over time, like, the meat just sits there. And so somebody said, well, look, after we worship our god or goddess, after we, we sacrifice it, why don't we recycle the meat? It's good meat. I mean, we're only offering the best of the animals anyway. So why don't we sell that meat to people? Make money, we can put it back into, you know, our religious faiths and, and put it back into, you know, the, whatever God we're worshiping. People get to eat good meat and, and, and everybody wins. It's, it's a nice way of recycling. And some people thought this was a great idea, you know. You get some really, you know, some good meat and, and it's not going to waste and, and it's affordable and, and all of that's good. But some people, particularly Jewish people, said that's super offensive, because that meat is tainted by idol worship. That meat is tainted by the pagan worship services where they sacrificed that animal to that god or goddess. And so for the Jewish people, as they looked as, their tr- one of the biggest, most important things for the Jewish folks, if you understand the law of Moses, is a lot of them, they have dietary restrictions. Eating kosher was a matter of life and death at one point to them. And so then, spiritually speaking, they saw it as a matter of life and death. And so a lot of them decided, hey, eating this meat sacrificed to idols, that's not kosher. And so imagine, like, we have church. We have, you know, we, we have, every month we've got a potluck here at church. And so the, 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 the apostles, who they, I mean, they also had potlucks. Everybody likes to eat. They, they, they said, okay, well, if we're going to have a potluck, let's make sure that all the meat that's brought is meat that's not going to offend people. And so one of the, 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 the questions that needed answered was, should Christians eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols? And according to the, the elders of Jerusalem, and according to the apostles who met with the elders of Jerusalem, and according to Paul, who worked and lived via the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and took this letter, the answer was no. Christians should not eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols. There is really no way, there's no ambiguity in Acts chapter 15. There's no real wiggle room. They're simply saying you must abstain from eating food that has been sacrificed to idols. Cool. Issue over, right? (laughs) Well, like, people are people. And just like today, you know, the the church or a religious institution or body can say, hey, this is what we think, and, you know, half the church says we disagree with you. That's what happened back then. You see, there was lots of people all over the church that were saying, listen, we like eating this meat. It's cheap. It's good meat. It's it's readily available. We've been doing it for a long time. We don't want to give this up. And so this becomes an issue. We don't think for us it's it's, it's that big of a deal. But for them, if you understand, like it, it has to do with how they eat every day, but it also has to do with their view of God. You see, the Jews saw this as participating in idolatry. The Jews saw, understood this as a completely blasphemous to their faith. This is not a minor side issue. Like, this is not like a matter of opinion that, that you and I might think, oh, it's no big deal. Let's just live and let live. To them, this had to do with the very core fundamental beliefs about who God was and how we worship him and how we interact with him. And so it was a big deal, and tensions were high. And when people argued, they got real mad, and there were lots of insults thrown around, and lots of people that got really, really freaked out about it. And it was going on everywhere. And so as we read in the New Testament, as it turns out, Paul, who writes letters to various churches, has to deal with this issue again and again and again. For example, he deals with it in the book of Romans. And here's what he writes, doubling down, emphasizing the truth about what the Holy Spirit wants with meat sacrificed to idols. In the book of Romans, we read Paul address the issue this way. He says, I know and am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. 
For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And then he addresses it again in, in the book of 1 Corinthians. He says, so what about eating meat that's been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really a god. There's only one god. We can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we don't eat it. And we don't gain anything if we do. I just want to let that sink in here. <laughs> the Apostle Paul writing at least in the same decade, addresses an issue of great importance to the church. A matter of whether there is one God or not one God, who God is, how we worship him, a core fundamental idea of Christianity in the first century. And in one letter, the Apostle Paul says, the Holy Spirit has told us, do not eat meat sacrificed to idols. You must abstain from it. And then to Rome and Corinth and some other places we're not going to quote because, you know, time. Paul says, it doesn't matter what you eat. Go for it. Eat what you want. I enjoy when people who don't see any tension or conversation in the Bible, like they think that the Bible just fits together perfectly. I really enjoy their attempts to make this fit together. It doesn't work well. It never makes any sense. Like... The fact of the matter is this. There was a time when Paul said, the Holy Spirit is telling you, church, don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. And then there's another time or a couple where Paul says, the Holy Spirit, he says, the Lord Jesus, God is telling you it's fine to eat meat. God, according to Paul, said, don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. And then God, according to Paul, said, yeah, it's fine. Go ahead and eat meat sacrificed to idols. And I think that's amazing. Because, you know, I don't know, maybe Paul changed his mind. Maybe he, you know, in com, you know, communion with God and the Holy Spirit at one point thought, well, God is telling us to do this, and so he wrote it down. Then another time, you know, he thought, well, maybe God's telling this, and so he wrote that down. Maybe he just changed his mind. Or maybe Paul understood there was something culturally. We've talked about that before, that, you know, a lot of times these things are dictated uh, by, by the culture that's going on. We talked about that in our last sermon series, that, you know, what appears to be a condemnation sometimes is not. It's just something for that time and place. Maybe in one time and place you shouldn't eat meat and sacrifice idols. In another time and place, yeah, have at it. Who cares? I don't know. Maybe there's something we haven't figured out. But here's what we know for sure. This idea that the apostles always just have the answers to all of life's questions, and that's what makes them who they are, cannot be true. Paul's faith was very clearly something that was in flux. It was very obviously a conversation. It was an honest dialogue with God and the church. Paul did not just say, these are the facts, this is right doctrine, this is what everybody has to believe, this is what everybody has to agree with. Paul didn't just say, okay, I have my facts, I have discovered them, and now I declare these facts, and then I defend these facts, and once I do that, then God will love us. That can't be Paul at all, because Paul is perfectly comfortable writing to one group of people in one context, hey, don't eat this meat, and another group of people in another context, go ahead and eat the meat, and that tells us that at the very least, the truth is a little fungible here. And we can figure out maybe, you know, we can, we can, we can talk and, and, and have conjecture about how and why, but the truth is, it was subject to interpretation. It was an open dialogue. For Paul, then, his faith was not based on having the right answers all the time, because he changed his mind, or he saw the right answers as being different in different times and places. For Paul, his faith was based on trusting Jesus. And Jesus only. His faith was based on living life, as he writes in Romans, a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He saw his Christianity as a life lived in um, sensitivity that God is all around us and that the Holy Spirit is within us. He saw his faith as a dance with God. They were dance partners. He would zig and God would zag and he would zag and God would zig. And it was a beautiful relationship in which Paul was able 
to evolve and change and grow and decide that maybe he believes something in one time and he doesn't maybe believe it in another time and maybe a time that he, he doesn't believe this, but now he does. But he's able to change. He has the freedom to change because God's love for Paul is not dependent on Paul having the right answers. God's love for Paul is dependent on the fact that God loved Paul. God is love. And Paul's relationship to God was not based on the things he said, did, or believed, but instead it was on the grace of God shown to us through Christ as we experience through the Holy Spirit. That was Paul's faith. And quite frankly, as I look at these scriptures and I see Paul saying two different things in, in two different places, I see a beautiful reflection of what faith is all about. It's not about having the answers and defending them to the death. It's about knowing the source of all answers, trusting in the source of all answers, and living life the best as we can, knowing that we have the freedom to grow and change and evolve. And I think that's great. But to tell you the truth, not everybody does. And I get it. And I do. You see, because there's a danger here with being willing to be open-minded enough to change your mind. What if you're wrong? Like, no, really, like, what if your first answer that you change from, what if that's, that was the right answer, and now when you've changed your mind, that's the new, the new answer is the wrong answer? You know, it seems to work fine for Paul. Okay, fine. But you see, there's another disciple, another apostle, and as Paul is writing in his book of Galatians, as he writes this letter to the church of Galatia, he describes, it didn't go so well for that guy, and that's Peter. You see, Peter, he was the start of this whole Gentile mess. Okay, Peter is the first guy to baptize a Gentile. No one else has done it. Peter is, is sort of the leader, you know, he's, he's a leader among the apostles. And so God speaks to him one day, we read this in the book of Acts, that God, you know, has a divine revelation and shares them all this stuff. And Peter is arguing with God because, well, he's Peter. And he, he finally decides, okay, I'm going to go baptize this guy. And he's the guy who baptizes the first Roman into the church and his whole household. He started the whole dis- debate. And so he was very much on team. The, the, the Gentiles are allowed into the church. But you see, Peter, his faith was in flux. He didn't always just believe one thing. He grew and changed and evolved. And so one day we read about this time in the book of Galatians where Paul says that there was a city called Antioch, and he discovered that Peter had changed his mind. And in Antioch, Peter was actually teaching that to become a Christian, you had to convert to Judaism. You had to be circumcised. You had to follow the law. You had to eat kosher. We read that he did this, we think, probably. Paul, at least, was was conjecturing that it was social pressure. You know, the people who were in charge in Antioch, they were the ones saying you have to become Jewish. And Peter, you know, he, he didn't want to upset people. He didn't want to be the outsider. He didn't want to be ostracized. And so he went along with the people who were in power and said, yeah, okay, fine. We'll, we'll not let anybody into the church who's not Jewish. And, and if you're going to come to the church, you have to be Jewish. Peter... His faith was just like Paul's, except where Paul's faith was a beautiful growth and progression, Peter went backwards. And Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, he says, I had to oppose Peter to his face. And I got to tell you, as a kid growing up in the church, that was the most terrifying proposition ever. Because, you know, I was taught that Christianity is all about being right. And the apostles, though, they're always right. If an apostle was against me, that means I must be wrong. If I disagree with an apostle, uh, I don't know if I can even call myself a Christian, and I can certainly not trust that I'm saved. This was my nightmare. And I think there's a part of a lot of Christians and a lot of us, I think if we were honest with ourselves, we understand that growth is scary. Evolution is scary. Because the truth of the matter is, if we change and we grow and we evolve, we can change and grow and evolve. It's possible to go from being wrong to being right, but it's just as possible to go from being right to being wrong. And if we still have that very fear-based idea of God only loves and cares for us when and only when we are right, then the idea of being like Peter 
and teaching the wrong thing and believing the wrong thing and going along with the wrong crowd is a terrifying thing. And so I kind of want to get rid of that terror. So let's talk about Christmas. You see, Christmas is, is about Jesus being born. Miraculous baby birth. Great. Awesome. We'll talk about that later. The Christmas story actually has two miraculous births. One of the miraculous births is John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. We think like a cousin. It was a, 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 a relative of Jesus. We'll call them cousins because it's just easier that way. John the Baptist was born to a guy named Zechariah. And Elizabeth, Zechariah and Elizabeth were this really, really old couple, and they tried for years to conceive a child, and they just couldn't do it. At this point, they'd given up because they were super, super old, and we understand, like, science and biology, there's a time to have babies, and there's a time where you don't have babies. And they had firmly reached that time to not have babies situation. So Zechariah was a a priest, and he was in the temple one day in Jerusalem, and he was doing his thing, and suddenly an angel named Gabriel— you may recognize him from other parts of the Christmas story, shows up and tells him, hey, listen, got to tell you, your wife's going to have a baby. And Zechariah, because apparently he didn't realize he was talking to an angel, argued with the angel, talked back to the angel, and said, listen, that's crazy talk. We're really old. We haven't even tried in years because we're real old. Like, this is not, this is not going to be a thing that's going to happen. Just leave me alone. And so the angel Gabriel says to him, listen, your wife's going to have a baby, but now since you argued with me, I need to really teach you not to be such an idiot with your words. So here's what we're going to do. You're not going to be able to speak until your son is born. And Zechariah lost the ability to talk. So the story goes, Zechariah, can't, he can't speak. He goes home and he and Elizabeth you know, and then she gets pregnant. Which if you think about the whole not being able to talk thing and then being old and seems really... Anyway, so here's the bottom line. (laughs) Elizabeth gets pregnant. Nine months passes. And John is born, just like the angel had promised. Now, I gotta be honest. I'm somebody who says a lot of dumb stuff. You can rewind this sermon two sentences, and you'll get there. This is sort of my nightmare. Like, I didn't know angels had the ability just to make you not be able to talk because you said something dumb. I probably should be on the lookout for that sort of thing now. And, you know, so I would think, like, okay, so we know Zechariah is wrong. He's wrong. He was wrong to question God. He was wrong in his faith. He was wrong to argue with the angel. And he suffered a, a, a temporary physical consequence of that. If anybody would be angry and would feel that God was not with him during this time, that God did not love him, if this fear-based idea of religion where we only are accepted when we have the right answers, if that was in any way true, then Zechariah's first words would be, I'm so sorry, God. I really wish that I had been better. Please love me again. And in Luke chapter 1, we read, these are Zechariah's first words. After his son is born, the gospel according to Luke, Zechariah says, Praise the Lord, the God of Israel. He has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. Zechariah is in no way bitter or angry or upset. Because Zechariah understood a point that we need to hear desperately. Zechariah was wrong, okay? He believed something incorrect about God. He believed that he and his wife could not conceive a child. He argued with an angel. There is no way around it that Zechariah had bad theology. He was incorrect in what he believed. And he suffered a consequence for that. And yet, on the back end of it, he said with confidence, God is with us. God hadn't abandoned Zechariah. God didn't go anywhere. God didn't say, I don't love you anymore. He didn't say, well, sorry, you're no longer one of mine. God had been with Zechariah the whole time. 
And that mirrors beautifully what's going on with the people of Israel. The people of Israel for centuries had been promised this Messiah, and they kind of had started to lose hope that the Messiah was coming because the Messiah never seemed to show up. And and there's there's several hundred years where it seems like God isn't speaking to anybody, and there's no more prophets, and and, and a lot of bad stuff's happening, and people start wondering, hey, has God left us? And so Zechariah says, no, God didn't go anywhere. God has been with us this whole time. A theme of Christmas, which we'll talk about in the coming weeks, is that God is always with us. With us, God had been with Israel even when they didn't think that he was. God had been with Zechariah even when he didn't think he was. And you know, I'm pretty sure, looking at the life of Peter, that God was with Peter even when he was wrong. Because you know, Peter comes back around. We have First and Second Peter in our Bible written by the guy. He was a roller coaster, this guy. I mean, he was up and he was down. But God was with him the entire time. Just as God is with Paul. Here is the vital truth we have to understand. Okay? We're dealing with an infinite being. We're talking about things which are unknowable and improvable. That's why we call it faith. Okay? You are probably very right about a lot of what you believe about God. But you also, in all likelihood, are very wrong about some things you believe about God. Me too. Me too. There's tons of things I am sure I am right about. And there are tons of things that eh, probably Drew's an idiot. That's being human. That's being a person. But when we have things figured out, God loves us and is with us. And when we have things not figured out, God is with us and loves us. When we're telling the truth, God loves us and is with us. When we're telling lies, God loves us and is with us. When we have right information, good theology... Sound doctrine, says my old preachers. God is with us. And when we're people who, we don't have sound doctrine, well, God's still with us. God's love for us is not contingent on us being right. God's presence in the world is not contingent on us having correct information about him. He was with Peter. He was with Zacharias. He was with Israel when they doubted the Messiah was coming. He was with Paul when Paul was growing a good way. And we have to understand that Christianity is a journey and a process. And as we go through life, God is with us in the good times and in the bad times. When we have our act together and when we don't. When we are an absolute train wreck of a human being, God is with us. And when we're an example for other people to follow, God is with us because God is always with us. Christianity is not about having the right answers. Christianity is about trusting and following and holding on for dear life in the God who does have the answers and enjoying life in his spirit in every season of our lives. This morning, on our second week, we're here is called Every Season's Reason. You're going to hear a lot that Jesus is the reason for the season because we love to rhyme things And that's the way Christmas goes. The truth is, Jesus is the reason for this season, sure, but he's also the reason for every season. Jesus transcends Christmas. It's not just about a time of year. It is about our entire lives. And this morning, as we consider Zacharias and and, and Peter and Paul and and all of these ideas, these, these, I think, toxic ideas I was taught as a kid, and maybe you guys were too, and, and what it means to be a Christian, as we consider all of that, we learn what I think is an absolutely beautiful Lesson, And that lesson is this. Our second lesson from the reason for every season is this. Faith is a journey and a process in which we will always be changing. And God will be with us through it all. Faith is a journey and a process in which we will always be changing. And God is with us through it all. It was Christmas time. And this has to do with Christmas time. Because here's the deal. I promise you. How you feel about Christmas is very different than how you used to. Maybe for some of you, it's a good thing. You know, maybe for some of you, like, you love Christmas so much now, and, and it's not what it used to be. Maybe some of you, it's the opposite. Like, you used to be Buddy the Elf, and now you're Scrooge. I don't know. But you change. You know, you're not the people you were five years ago or ten years ago. And some years, you just don't feel it. And some other times, you just you totally do feel it. And Christmas is your favorite. 
And I think at Christmas, I think it, it's kind of a microcosm for all of life. You know, there's been some years at Christmas where, like, I can't get enough of things. And there's some years at Christmas where I'm like, man, just let January come. I think sometimes we feel bad about that. You know, we feel bad about the ups and downs of our lives. But the truth of the matter is this. God doesn't feel bad about that. That's just being a person. And God is not sitting here saying, listen, when you meet this standard, when you believe these things, when you accept these truths, then and only then I am with you. That's not it. I mean, what, what, that's not good news. I mean, maybe this for some of you, you're like really good at life, but I'm pretty fairly terrible at life. It's not good news if I have to get my act together for God to love me because it's not going to happen. The good news of the gospel is that God is with us regardless. Good times, bad times in between. When we are like Paul and we have a healthy dialogue with God, God is a dance partner and we're able to see the nuance and the gray areas of life and we can proclaim truth in different ways in different times. Oh, we're just doing great. God is with us. And when we're Zacharias, we're arguing with the angel. We're telling God what he can and can't do. When we're Peter and we're discriminating against people through things that are no fault of their own. Look, we need to repent of those things. Don't get me wrong, but God doesn't leave us in those times. God sticks with us and helps us see that we can be better. We change and we evolve and we grow. And that is not scary because it comes with the promise and the assurance of a God who loves us universally and unconditionally. That love is for everybody. Everyone is encompassed in this blessing and this love. And so this year, if you love Christmas, awesome. Have at it. If this year you just can't get excited about it, okay. You are who you are. Understand that God is with you no matter what. So when the musicians are going to come forward, they're going to sing us a song. You'll sing with them. We offer an invitation each and every week to take God up on his offer. It is no way a jumping through a hoop in order to be saved. It is not, that is not it, okay? It is an embracing of the truth that God has already said about us. It's not a do this, you're going to hell, but instead it is a promise that as we embrace who God is, that we understand this relationship with God. The Bible tells us that when we repent and are baptized, that something fundamentally changes. We repent, we say, I want things God's way. I want to believe uh, this beautiful truth about God, and I want to do things his way. And in baptism, we see a picture of that. Our old selves go down the water. It's like uh, we're being put to death. Our new selves are born again as we get out of the water. God says his spirit is with us. He says that we are clean. Our, our sins are washed away, and we are his. You never made that decision? We got a nice warm baptistry. All sorts of people can do it. Let's talk. If you're not an immersed believer in Christ, looking for a perfect church home, this place is not it. But we do serve a perfect God. We want to connect. We want to call. We want to cultivate. We want to meet new people. We want to share the gospel. We want to grow up while we do it. But along the way, as we grow and change and evolve, sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes we've got it figured out, sometimes we don't. But no matter what, we trust in the God shown to us in Christ who is always with us. As we stand and as we sing.